This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. And I'm Jess Hanam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Well, Jamal, we're on the verge of the 20th anniversary of the September 11th um, events in the United States and, and uh, catastrophic war consequences, war on terror, everything. And uh, we're going to take some time later on in the show to get a little reflection on the last 20 years, the good, bad, and the ugly, unfortunately. And then we'll be talking about uh, how six Palestinians were able to escape from a maximum security prison, not very maximum security, I guess, uh, Israeli maximum security uh, prison. So we got Lots to talk about today, and uh, but first we're going to be listening and watching to a really fantastic interview you did with Carlos Latouf, who's a uh, political cartoonist living in Brazil, who's been drawing cartoons about police brutality, uh, occupation of Palestine, just an amazing, an amazing you know political satirist and cartoonist and. It's always refreshing to hear those kinds of interviews and see what Carlos is up to. That's right, Jess. Uh, his um, political activism and cartoons span all the way from Brazil to the Middle East and, and beyond. Right. And, and uh, he's been drawing cartoons since the 1990s. Uh, of course, um, many of those cartoons about his home country, Brazil, but also he uh, came to, um, you know, rose into the spotlight during the Arab Spring. Right. And what I describe him in, in our interview, he's a, 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 an equal opportunity <laughs> critic. So, uh, you know, the United States, his own government, Donald Trump, uh, Arab leaders, uh, you name it. Let's uh, watch uh, Carlos. A picture is worth a thousand words, but in my opinion, a cartoon is worth 10,000 words. It's more expressive and touches on one's inner feelings. Well, our guest Carlos Latouf has been drawing cartoons since the 1990. Carlos is a Brazilian political cartoonist and is no stranger to controversy. His provocative and unapologetically graphic cartoons have been enjoyed by many, but also they've been criticized by others. Welcome to Arab Talk, Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to be here, here in your show. So as a disclaimer, I should tell that I'm a very big fan of your art. Uh, let's begin with your journey. Uh, how did you get into political cartoons? Well, uh, when I started uh, <clears throat> drawing, I was a kid. And uh, when I was a teenager, I, uh, I didn't have, because the dictatorship in Brazil, I didn't have any involvement with uh, the social movement, the student movement. So in that time, drawing for me, it was just something to have fun, maybe to, to be a professional artist, is, uh, artist working for magazines, uh, magazines uh, making comics, but not political content, just comics, hero content, uh, content etc., Sat satire, etc., but not political uh, motivated uh, content. Uh, when I have contact with um, uh, leftist trade unions in Brazil in 1990, um, I started to, to be involved uh, with uh, political topics. And that's why I say this is the, 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 the moment when I become a political cartoonist because before that, m my mindset was to become a cartoonist, but not a political cartoonist. I imagine myself drawing comics for fun, for, you know, uh, entertainment. But after this contact with 
a trade union newspaper, which has uh, have uh, uh, newspapers, uh, and usually they use political cartoons, and they hire me uh, for making cartoons for these newspapers. I become a, a political cartoonist. So I've actually read somewhere that uh, Graham Fowell, uh, former chairman of the Cartoonist Club uh, of the UK, compared your work to Bansky. Others in the Middle East have compared you to Naji Ali. You know, and I'm sure you know who's Naji Ali. Where do you see yourself fit? Oh well, uh, I'm not that famous like Banksy, and uh, I'm not. I, I cannot be compared with Naji Al Ali because Naji Al Ali was Palestinian, and he he's a, a representative of. Uh, uh, Palestinian people and Palestinian sovereignty. Um, I I'm just a, a friend of Palestinians, a Brazilian cartoonist who care about the human rights and Palestine. He, of course, in other places in, in the world, and, and even in Brazil, for example, I made uh, countless cartoons about police brutality in Brazil. The situation in Turkey and Egypt, etc. But I have a crush for Palestinians because uh, I was there and I saw with myself how Palestinians live. So I think it's not fair to compare me with Banksy and and Naji Al Ali. I'm more humble. I'm more humble. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's if people want to compare you to this, I mean, you should take it. It's it's. Uh, I know you're very humble, but uh, I want to actually. You've mentioned, uh, uh, you know, your work in Brazil, uh, because what I like to describe you as, and I hope you accept that uh, from me, as an equal opportunity critic. You know, you, uh, you know, your work touches on on Brazil you 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 make fun out of uh, the political situation in Brazil uh, you the president of Brazil bolsonaro you have many cartoons about him you criticize all arab leaders arab muslim others uh, including you know, you've mentioned turkish president erdogan uh, and 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 many others uh, so uh, how did you um, Kind of, you know, you have a theme, you know, you, your theme goes into capitalism, globalization, uh, occupation, human rights, Zionism, uh, U.S. military inv intervention. How did you gravitate towards these different themes? Uh, I, I now, uh, my job is more easy, if I, if I, say, if I say so, because um, we, we have the social medias now. And it's more easier to be in touch with people in Palestine, for example, because before internet, the only way for you to know what is happening in Palestine was through mainstream media. But now uh, you have not only mainstream media. Let's take, for example, the Twitter. You have the mainstream media, you have the news agencies, but you have also um uh, activists artists um human rights ngos etc so uh, i i think it's more easier uh to to be informed about the situation of many countries for example if you want to know what is happening in sri lanka now just go to twitter search for sri lanka and you're gonna have Many people from Sri Lanka is uh, telling you the situation there, or in Congo, or in uh, Myanmar, you name it. So uh, the information society, let's say that, um, uh, it's a great tool. Uh, the social medias are, are great tools for political cartoonists uh, nowadays. So do you find yourself connected to the rest of the world? Because you've mentioned you're absolutely right. Um, social media and the internet has connected the world really like no other way. 
you know, for example, you know, just take the example of Brazil. I mean, you have the haves and the have-nots, the, 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 the rich and powerful and the poor. And that theme repeats itself in Africa and Southeast Asia, in, 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 in the Middle East. So do you try to kind of connect the dots to see, well, that's what's going on in the favelas in, in, in Brazil, but I look what's going on in the United States when it comes to the, uh, you know, black power, I mean, the, uh, you know, what's happening to African Americans in, in the United States, what's happening to others in other countries? Yes, because um, uh, we, we have enemies in common. So if we compare the situation in the United States and Brazil, especially, let's say, about the black people, uh, even in the United States, in, in Brazil, you, you suffer from the slavery. Uh, the, the police brutality, the racism, uh, they are a subproducts of the slavery age. So we are very uh, far from that age, but we are still suffering from the consequences of centuries of slavery and imperialism and colonialism. So mostly of the countries and the whole world uh, already suffer from colonialism or imperialism or slavery, racism in a way or another. So uh, my perception is, uh, and I had opportunity to visit many places around the world um, and to be in touch with social uh, uh, movements and workers all around the world, and my perception is uh, we we are, we can live in different countries and speak different languages, different cultures, but we, in a way or another, we have the same enemies. Well, talking about enemies, I mean, uh, you've been arrested three times in uh, in Brazil uh, because of uh, your. Uh, basically cartoons about police brutality. Uh, this is a common theme. We've seen police brutality again in the United States, uh, all over the Middle East and other countries. Do you worry about, uh, I mean, having, you know, making enemies? Uh, 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 do you worry about that physically? Do you worry about that? Or do you consider this uh, part of the job description? Yeah, yeah, not anymore. Uh, when uh, I started to make political cartoons and share them on internet, uh, the old internet <laughs> in the end of the 90s, uh, I felt myself concerned, worried about. But now, not anymore, because uh, it's part of the job, definitely. Because it's very important for for an artist who decides to become a, a political cartoonist. Uh, it's very important to realize the risks, to assume you are uh, sometimes putting your life in risk because um, the dictators, uh, the authoritarian governments, the lobbies, uh, they they are enemies of freedom of speech. And depending where you live, uh, they can try to shut you down uh, uh, by many ways, you know, even uh, prosecuting you or arresting you or even killing you, you know. Uh, in Brazil, um, I spent, since 1997, uh, I spent years long making cartoons exposing the police brutality in Brazil. And, and that's why I was arrested for three times uh, for making graffitis against br police brutality or cartoons uh, on the internet. And of course, Brazil, the poli Brazilian police has uh, a very notorious record of human rights violations, murders, uh, assassinations. Uh, and let's take, for example, uh, Marielle, uh, uh, who uh, was a representative, a politician, 
uh, who uh, was shot down by uh, uh, paramilitary groups linked to police forces in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, they can kill anyone they want to, they, they perceive as a threat to their interests. And uh, I, I don't live uh, in Rio de Janeiro anymore. I moved from there because uh, the, the, the life quality in Rio decreased in, in, a very, uh, in, in a very clear way. And I decided to move from there to have a better life in South Brazil. And um, uh, maybe if I was living in Rio and making cartoons now about police brutality, and especially now about the paramilitary uh, groups linked to the cops, uh, I... I think I could be shot down in some moment. It, it, it was not impossible to happen, you know. But uh, as I said, uh, I, uh, I'm very uh, convinced about my role as a political cartoonist, my historical role, my social role. And I, of course, I don't think... Uh, I don't spend my time thinking I can be shot down, I can be killed, but I understand it can happen. It, it could happen, unfortunately. But c'est la vie, as the French say. Well, that's uh, very brave of you to even think about, about this. So uh, many people have compared uh, you know, Bolsonaro to Donald Trump, which we've had here. And uh, we got rid of him in the United States, barely got rid of him. I, I should say barely got rid of him. Do you expect the political situation to change or, or you're stuck with him? Uh, the, the, the situation in Brazil is very tricky. I, I will try to sum up things. Um, yeah, Bolsonaro is a, 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 a poorly drawn caricature of Trump. And his followers can be compared to the Trump followers in the United States. The same way the, the Trump administration uh, empowered the white supremacists in the United States, uh, Trump did not create... Uh, this white supremacists in the United States. It was something uh, that always was there, you know. The, the, the su white supremacists always were there with different names, with different uh, 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 um, uh, uh, lookings, etc., like the KKK, for example. So Trump did not create, but he empowered those uh, reactionary forces. In Brazil, it's more or less like the same, because Bolsonaro did not create the fascism here. It was something that was, was always present in the Brazilian society, but in, in, the, in the shadows, you know. I think... The fascists, especially after the end of the military dictatorship in Brazil uh, in the 80s, uh, when we had the, the redemocratization re uh, re of, of the country, uh, those fascists were put aside. They, they had to hide from the lights, you know. Uh, they... They hide themselves in the shadows. When Bolsonaro raised to power, he also empowered those forces, more or less like Trump did. And Bolsonaro, it's quite clear, he's not thinking by himself. He's always following the steps of uh, Trump. Let's take, for example, the invasion of the capital by his followers. Mm -hmm. Today, 
Now, when we are talking, it's September 7th. It's holiday, a national holiday in Brazil. We, we celebrate the independence of Brazil, <laughs> the so-called independence of Brazil from Portugal. We were colonized by Portugal. And every time you, you have the September 7th in Brazil, this national holiday, you have celebration with the military parade, military parades, etc. Bolsonaro uh, mobilized his followers to protest against the judicial uh, system in Brazil, the high court, high court in, in, in Brazil. And mostly of the times, Bolsonaro is in, inciting his followers to invade and occupy the high court. The same way uh, Trump did with his followers and capital. But the same way Trump failed and his followers failed to, because to, to impose a coup d'etat, uh, you need more than simply occupy a building. Bolsonaro will also fail. But the problem in Brazil is, is because different from the United States, Trump did not have uh, the, the support from the military. In Brazil, because we are still we are still a colony, that's the problem. Sometimes it, it's tricky to compare the United States with Brazil because the United States is the colonizer and Brazil is the colonized. And we are still colonized. And Bolsonaro is a, a great representation of a colonized leader. He represents the interests of the United States and Brazil. He salutes the American flag. You have, you have a video of Bolsonaro saluting the American flag. He, re he welcomed representatives of the CIA in Brazil. When he won the elections, he made a trip to the United States to pay a visit to Langley, to headquarters of CIA. So Bolsonaro is a representative of the American interests in South America, in Latin America, especially against Venezuela. That's why, in a way or another, the White House is working with the military and Bolsonaro, you know. It's interesting for uh, the U.S. interests to keep Bolsonaro exactly where he, he is. But the guy is completely narrow-minded. The guy is a complete uh, 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 asshat, you know. So uh, he's now trying to test the limits of democracy in Brazil. In fact, he, he wants to destroy the democracy in Brazil. So uh, the situation is, is very complicated now, but exactly because Bolsonaro is too blunt, is too stupid, uh, he's losing support day after day. And now, the, in my humble opinion, the only uh, section of the society who, uh, which is supporting Bolsonaro are the military, the generals. Why? Because the military are following, following orders from White House, you know that. And because Bolsonaro um, uh, distributed many jobs for the military and the government. So the military, they are fond of Bolsonaro government because they, they are earning money. They are earning lots of money to be part of the government. You have more military in the government now than in the past during the military dictatorship. It's incredible. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so as I uh, said earlier, I mean, millions, I think, of people like your cartoons, but you have your critics. And amongst the biggest critics and or why you have been criticized for, for example, it comes from Israel. Uh, Israeli officials and the uh, 
Simon Wiesenthal Center accused you of anti-Semitism for com- comparing the Israeli occupation's brutality to Nazism. That's what they say. What do you say to this? Well, uh, in this case, specifically of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, they used uh, as an excuse to accuse me of to, to be the third most, most anti-Semitic person in the whole world in 2013, a cartoon I made about Netanyahu squeezing the dead body of a Palestinian uh, child and uh, falling from her body, votes in a ballot. They say this cartoon uh, was offensive to the Prime Minister of Israel and was anti-Semitic. So uh, they they put me in a li- they have a, a, every year they make a list of the ten most anti-Semitic persons in the world. In 2013, the first one uh, was, if I remember well. The, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. The second was the Iranian regime. And the third, me, for making that cartoon. Wow, <laughs> you made the list. Yeah. You made the list with Iran and uh, the Muslim Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's quite clear when you see, for example, Najida, na, 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 Nashida Tlaibi. Uh, the, Rashida Tlaib, the, the congresswoman. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, when you see her being attacked viciously by the Israeli lobby, when you 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 have other congresswoman uh, like uh, Omar Omar Ilhan Omar. So the name is Ilhan, Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar. Yeah. yeah, Ilhan Omar, and many other artists, politicians. Uh, for example, see for example what happened with uh, Jeremy Corbyn in UK. When you have people who decide to support human rights in Palestine, to support the sovereignty uh, of Palestinians, uh, to, this, to, to support a Palestinian state, when you have someone who dare to speak on behalf of Palestinians, you are automatically labeled as an anti-Semite. No matter if you are a politician, if you are a journalist or an artist or an actor or a singer, you name it. But this is a a very well-known strategy from the Israeli lobby in order to criminalize criticism towards Israel. You cannot say anything against the Israeli apartheid. And when you make it, when you make cartoons, the cartoons, the political cartoons are very strong, uh, 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 a very powerful uh, uh, tool of communication. And when you publish one of one cartoon about Palestine on social medias, this cartoon will circulate in many other social medias, in many countries, and many people will reach that cartoon. You're going to have, for example, uh, teachers who going to use those cartoons to illustrate essays uh, or books, etc. So they know how powerful the political cartoons are. That's why... They they are always trying to to say Latouf is anti Semite for making because he's making cartoons against uh, the Israeli apartheid. So it's a by the way uh, by the way uh, mentioning uh, representatives uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, they both came under attack for retweeting one of your cartoons, as you exactly. know. Exactly. They retweeted one of your cartoons and they came under under um, heavy attack. Um, what's your connection uh, to the Middle East? I know that many Palestinians would like to claim you as one of their own, uh, <laughs> but you're not Palestinian. Uh, what are your Arab roots? My grandfather was Lebanese. But it didn't count because I didn't meet him. And he didn't uh, 
tell anything about Lebanon or about religion or politics or, or politics, anything. Culture, nothing, nothing. My family just have the surname, but don't have any direct uh, uh, connection with uh, Lebanon or the Arab world. So my affection for Palestine and Palestinians uh, happened when I decided to see with my own eyes the, how Palestinians live and the occupied territories in 1998. When I decided to take a plane and spend the time there to see, to have a more concrete uh, uh, perception uh, the, of the situation of Palestinians under occupation. And after this uh, uh, contact with Palestinians, uh, uh, th this contact opened the doors for um, a, a better understanding of the Arab world, you know, about other uh, places in the Arab world and the Arab and Muslim world. Carlos Latouf contributes regularly to many publications, but his work can be found on latoufcartoons.wordpress.com. Go to his website, check out his work. Uh, Carlos, I want to thank you for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you very much. And you can also uh, follow my cartoons on mondovice.net and mintpressnews.com. Thank you very much, Amal, for this invitation, and I wish you all the best. And please take care because this uh, coronavirus is, is for real, man. It's for real and it's killing people. Please stay safe. Thank you. You too. You too. Thank you. Thank you. That's the voice and the face of uh, Carlos Latouf, the infamous cartoonist and political satirist, the equal opportunity critic, from Brazil and Bolsonaro all the way to uh, the Israeli apartheid system in Palestine and beyond. Very refreshing, very revealing. And the one thing that uh, about Carlos Jamal is that this is not his uh, first rodeo. He's been doing this for decades now, 30 years plus. Well, yeah, he's been since the 1990s, and he's always a spot on... Uh, you know, we've we've mentioned uh, we're going to be talking about the six Palestinians uh, uh, political prisoners who escaped uh, the maximum security Israeli jail. He already has a cartoon about this. You know, so his his you know he keeps up with what's going on uh, globally, not uh, only in Brazil. He also makes the connection. You know between different uh, regimes and different governments. As you know, police brutality in Brazil. He, he, he was in prison three times because right. of his cartoons in Brazil. Right. And he has been criticized by many governments, including uh, he criticized Erdogan of Turkey, of course, Israel. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, he's doing something right. Well, he's, he's got an opportunity to be critical because he's a political cartoonist and satirist. He has the opportunity to reach people and to say things that most people are unable to. And uh, the fact that he's been arrested, I guess, is a testament to how successful he is at speaking through his cartoons and his satire to the, you know, the injustices that are occurring, as, as you said, and as he has articulated from Brazil to Palestine. I mean, Brazil is in a very tough situation now. I know we're not going to be talking uh, a lot about this, but Bolsonaro and Trump are cut from the same cloth, and so many hundreds of thousands of people are getting infected and dying in Brazil because of a kind of, you know, completely ignorant and out of control, you know, leader right now. And um, so if anybody is able to confront that, uh, that authoritarian, thuggish uh, rule, it's, uh, it's Carlos, and we're lucky to have him. That's right. So uh, moving on, Jess, uh, the big story in the Middle East, and actually it, it made headlines uh, worldwide, is the uh, Shawshank uh, 
<laughs> what is it? The redemption. Uh, I'm sorry, Shoshank Redemption. And actually, Palestinians have been referring it to uh, to it as the Shakshuka Redemption. <laughs> That's so funny. And, and it's, uh, so people who don't know what's the Shoshank Redemption uh, prison, uh, that's a very... A uh, famous film by uh, that featured Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins, uh, and Tim Robbins, uh, the main one of the main characters, escaped by digging a hole through the prison wall and making it uh, outside. And apparently, these six uh, Palestinians, uh, Jess, uh, they've used uh, a spoon or spoons to dig up a hole in the maximum security Israeli prison, and they all made it outside. Now, I think we're going on uh, four or four or five days. Right. There is a massive, massive uh, manhunt by Israel, and Israel has been going and arresting their family members. Right. That's their tactic. You know, so, so, that's their tactic. So that's their tactic. Right. They've been going from town to town, village to village, um, arresting uh, you know anyone who is associated with, uh, with the prisoners, of course, it 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 has caused a, ma- a major embarrassment to the um, Israeli regime and government. So they're putting all the resources. The West Bank, because of Rosh Hashanah, has been under lockdown. Right. So they've taken advantage of this lockdown. The the different towns and, and villages they're going to where they think these uh, prisoners uh, might be at. And uh, but Jamal, we you... we it's important that uh, you actually have interviewed one of the prisoners um, in your film. You know, um, you know your your incredible film and documentary that you did about Palestine. Um, you actually had the opportunity to speak with and interview one of the people that was arrested, put into this maximum security prison for so many years, and then eventually released. Correct. And and so that was Zakaria Zubedi. Zakaria Zubedi, actually, he's probably the most famous uh, out of uh, all the six, uh, you know, the, the prisoners. Uh, and we interviewed him, and when he was Basically, the Israelis were looking on the, on the lookout. Right. Uh, so we had to go to his hideaway. And we're talking about Occupied Minds. That's a film that uh, I produced with David Michaelis uh, in 2005. And so we went to Jenin, where he's from, you know, and uh, we made contact uh, earlier and arranged uh, to, to go and talk to him. And he was uh, basically... Uh, we went uh, from two different uh, hideaway homes, uh, you know, and people uh, that accompanied accompanied him were always on the lookout for Israeli drones, Israeli helicopters. That's right. In the sky, it was a very kind of harrowing uh, experience, but basically a very bright guy, by the way, uh, when we spoke to him. And because, you know, David Michaelis, uh, Zakaria Zubeli doesn't speak English, so he speaks Arabic fluently, of course, that's his native tongue. And he speaks Hebrew fluently because he has been imprisoned many, so many times. times. I mean, right. he's a child He's a child of the first intifada. Right. That's, that's what. So I said, you know, we had the dilemma to translate so David can understand him. And he said, no, no, let's do it in Hebrew. So he actually did that segment, the whole interview, uh, in Hebrew. And uh, the, you know, the real story behind his uh, basically resistance, of course, he has been totally disfran- disfranchised for anything that to, de- to do with peace talks and Oslo, uh, you know, he, he, in the interview itself, he says, don't even be- don't believe the Israeli left. This is when there was actually an Israeli That's right. left. That's right. This is when we were talking about Paris. And, and so and he said, no, no, they are actually, they lied to you more than the Israeli right. I mean, this is how smart he was. And so at the time, you know, he was involved in a theater with his family, his mother, and his mother was shot dead uh, just by Israeli soldiers. And uh, and then he had some of the Israeli leftists who used to come to Jenin to participate in the theater, and he was right. very bitter because not a single one picked up the phone to call him and offer their condolences. So well, that's kind I of like... He- yeah, but Jamal, that's that's why he was, uh, he's, as you said, brilliant, 
you know, kind of uh, analyst, political uh, analyst, and, you know, why he was so perceived to be so dangerous among the Israelis. It's why he was arrested so many times, because he has an incredible ability to to kind of sift through the BS. And, you know, that's something you and I have been talking about for so many years about the this you've called it the so-called left. Uh, I've always said I don't even believe there's a left in, you know, among Israelis because they're all committed to the Zionist dream for the most part. And um, maybe that's why he's perceived as being so dangerous, because he's so clear, clear thinking. No, no, he's very clear. He's very clear about what's going on. And as you know, um, Jenin is a very tough place. Yes. Israel has destroyed uh, basically most of the uh, uh, the camp. Uh, That's right. In, 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 in Jenin. You know, it, it, they leveled uh, all the homes in 2002. That's right. And there was the massacre of Jenin. That's that, right. Uh, we don't talk about it often and people for, uh, ha- have forgotten about it. But that's a major massacre. Uh, you know, they basically surrounded the camp and and bombarded it and and leveled it on top of the occupants. And so he he comes uh, from the heart of resistance, and and Janine had ha- has had many martyrs. Uh, they've come under very strict and oppressive, uh, you know, rule uh, by by the Israelis. So now they're assuming basically he might have returned there. Unlikely. In my opinion, even in my opinion, if he if they return there, it it will be impossible to arrest him there because or there'll be a major massacre. Right. Because if he makes it there, people will fight the Israelis with their bare hands right. to prevent them from entering into into, into Jenin. Right. I, I've made a comment on Twitter uh, and I said unfortunately uh, I don't know. I mean, of course, we don't know where they went to, and and, and nobody should know. But uh, uh, the safest place, probably, for these political prisoners is to be in Gaza, right? Uh, because Israel is uh, basically Israeli soldiers are scared from going into Gaza. That's right. And there are less informers and Israeli spies. That's right. So, so the sad thing about it, if they get arrested, it would be because of informers and spies and others actually are now issuing warning and saying they might get arrested because the Palestinian Authority might arrest them. Well, unfortunately, Jamal, your analysis is spot on. And, uh, you know, over the years, the Israelis have cultivated a whole system of spies and informants, especially in the West Bank, and, you know, their methods for doing so, you know, either arresting and torturing people and only letting them go if they agree to be spies or informants, or getting dirt on people and threatening to expose them unless they do become spies or informers. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, You know, in Gaza, they've been able to root that out and be much more aggressive in combating spies and informants in Gaza. I think, though, you know, this is going to be a tough slog. I mean, they they will they will be in hiding, and who knows what's going to happen. But I want to make sure, but just one quick thing, our listeners and viewers need to know that these are political prisoners that were kept uh, under, you know, so-called maximum security prison, you know, uh, so let's keep in mind the thousands of political prisoners that are being kept, you know, in Israeli prisons, uh, Palestinian political prisoners. And and the one thing I forgot to mention is that there are riots now in other right. Israeli prisons, and Israel has uh, prevented now family members from visiting right. their loved ones right. inside there. So, so there's a whole lockdown, and of course... We probably need a whole hour to talk about the conditions in Israeli prisons. Maybe we should. The yeah. in, inhumane conditions, the torturing, the interrogation, all, all of all, all of that. I mean, there are books written about this. Right. Well, we'll we'll hopefully uh, do a complete show on Palestinian political prisoners and that history. And by the way, the prisoners who are in Israeli prisons go from. Basically, eight years old children, Palestinian children, all the way up to, you know, uh, 80 year olds. So they will imprison and torture and uh, administratively detain any and everybody that uh, they wish. Um, 
Well, Jamal, it's been 20 years, man. Can you believe we've, we're on to 20 years since 9-11? Can you believe it? No. I, I mean, thinking about it, that we're actually thinking, I'm trying to wrap my head how 20 years, I guess when you get older, <laughs> you don't want to believe 20 years have passed by. And 20 years have passed by. And I'm thinking, actually, we're commemorating 9-11 20 years later. And this was the biggest catastrophe that befell on this nation. And, and I'm thinking we're also in another catastrophe, which is COVID, which is kind right. of surreal because 20 years have passed. And, and uh, I'm trying to think about what else. Of course, many things have happened, we, and we'll talk about it on, on, on the global level. And it's very sad, of course, to you know, the memory of all the innocent lives that, uh, who have been lost both in the United States and abroad because of the wars that uh, were, uh, as a, uh, were a result to 9-11, and, and here we are 20 years later. Um, I mean, the question, are we better off? Well, it's, it's interesting uh, did, that you bring that. Did the United States win the war on terror, for example? You know, Jamal, it's, these are two great questions. A poll just came out. The majority of Americans believe that the United States has changed for the worse since 9-11. So in terms of the way the narrative has you know, been uh, attempted to be written in the United States is that the United States arose, you know, heroically from the ashes of 9-11 in, 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 in lower Manhattan. And look at all the great things that have happened, the war on terror, you know, security, all of these things. But apparently, based on the polling that has just come out, most Americans do not believe that the United States is actually better off since uh, what happened uh, 20 years ago on 9/11. I mean, you alluded to it. Let's, you know, uh, of course, the thousands of people that perished in the twin towers on the day of 9/11. Not to mention the thousands of, uh, um, you know, emergency workers and fire department and police officers who got sick and died since that time. So that number of people, individuals, and families who have suffered since 9-11 is enormous. But, you know, do we ever talk about the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and Iraqi children who perished? Are, are we talking about Afghanistan? Now we're talking about it, but we lose sight of the numbers of thousands, tens of thousands of Afghans that lost their lives and were injured at the time. The tens of thousands of injured soldiers, you know, men and women who served in the military with this failed war on terror. Uh, yes, I'm going to give you some staggering numbers. Okay. So so for our audience to just understand, it, and, and, and this is, of course, there is the Americans who, were, who have been affected, and then Afghanistan, Afghans, and in Iraq. So the, the price tag just is staggering. So first of all, of course, we have close to 3,000 innocent lives who were killed in the World Trade Center, Pentagon, and others. Then you have more than 7,000 American military personnel to date have died wow. in the U.S.-led wars because of 9-11. 50,000 plus were, have been wounded to date. An additional 30,000 active duty personnel and veterans of these wars have died by suicide. Yeah. That number is kept separate because there is the battlefield killed, killed, you know, in Afghanistan. And then there is, people don't talk about that. I, I, I just like 30,000 came back alive, made it back, but then they died because of suicide. More than 7,400 U.S. contractors were also killed yeah. in Afghanistan That's and right. Iraq alone. The cost of the wars, $6.4 trillion. That's T, T, trillion. Yeah, trillion dollars. 37 million people, this is on the global, uh, I mean, in, in, in the countries the U.S. went to Afghanistan, 37 million people have been made refugees. And we don't have the exact figure, but at least we know a minimum of a million Iraqis and Afghans have been killed. The number could be higher because there are different. Right. So, so this is just a slice so to our, see. Uh, let's answer your question, Jamal. Does that mean is the world and the United States better off since all this? 
No, no, it has been devastating. Yeah. I mean, the result, uh, it has been devastating 20 years. And probably, you know, don't forget also there are still people who are still suffering as a result. Right. Both in Iraq, both in Afghanistan, both on the military, people who serve there, they still uh, uh, suffer uh, from mental uh, problems because of, because of, uh, of the war, emotional problems and, and so forth. And then in addition to this, which we've talked about it, civil liberties in the United States Eroded. have been affected forever. Forever. You know, the Patriot Act is still on the books. Right. Hasn't, you know, you know. And civil liberties, people think about, you know, the American uh, Muslims who have been affected and entrapped and, and, and targeted and... Uh, under the guise of the war on on terror or under the guise of defeating Islamists abroad. Uh, and of course, this fueled uh, Islamophobia in this country and and added more fuel to to the white nationalism here. Listen, this the civil li li liberties affected everyone in the United States. Absolutely. And still do. And, and, and it's still, still going yeah, on. Yeah. It's still going on. The The laws that were passed, like the Patriot Act, where the government can listen to your phone call and, 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 and intercept your emails, is still on the books. That's right, Jamal. But let's look at the, let's look at the reason we destroyed Iraq and Afghanistan. It was to somehow win the war on terror. Remember, the war is the war on terror, which makes no sense. And so given the recent events in Afghanistan, given the takeover of the country by the Taliban and the close relationship between the Taliban and other groups, whether it's ISIS-K and they have a complex relationship with the Taliban, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whomever, you have to say that whatever $6.7 trillion to win the war on terror, I can't say that we're any safer now. We may be less safe now as a result of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq than we were before 9-11. So I, I'm not sure what we got out of this except devastation, destruction. Well, uh, when I, I, I researched this and the two points that keep coming up as far as successes, because everything we, we, we've I've mentioned and you've mentioned basically are... Net losses. Where's losses the net gain? Life. Where's the net gain? Yeah, net gain is the, the, that's what they put, is that we have not had any foreign terrorism uh, acts or successful foreignist, uh, foreign terrorist acts on this country since then because of all these new measures that have been enacted. The other thing, of course, the uh, killing of bin Laden. So that was, that was one of the goals that... Uh, that was kind of achieved. The other thing, but, and, and, and actually what we know, uh, at least because now you look more into it, that the United States suffers from domestic terrorism more than anything else. And there's a direct line, Jamal, between the terrorism that the United States engaged, with, uh, engaged in fighting for the last 20 years and the domestic terrorism that we're seeing right now. They're inextricably linked, you know, politically, psychologically, economically. And um, we're back to that question. Okay, yes, there haven't been any foreign terrorist attacks on this country. And yes, Osama bin Laden was, was uh, removed, was killed. But on balance, and that's really the question that, that I'll leave you with, and I'll just say on balance, in thinking about whether or not $6.7 trillion, millions of deaths, destruction, destabilization in the Middle East and the Arab world, it's hard to see how we're really better off now than we were before. No, no, no. I mean, like I, I started by saying, the uh, the results are really uh, staggering. The price tag is staggering. The results are devastating. So also our way of life the changes that happened, I just like, you know, miss the days when we used to go to the airport 20 minutes before the flight. <laughs> uh, just, just as, as a sim simple, as simple right. as this. Right. Just going there, walking all the way to the gate, taking people to the gate, for, taking people, taking people, yeah, taking people to the gate. I mean, 
I think there is a whole generation, Jess, young generation, who have not experienced right. travel like the way we experienced right. it before. So just on that simple level, that they're just like the ease that we used to conduct things, that I don't have to be afraid now going to a mall uh, thinking, you know, the the, the, th the thoughts that they planted in our heads for 20 years, you remember all these alerts, yellow alert, green alert, red alert, or, or going to a big building or or going to, to the airport, you know, right. uh, travel, taking off your shoes, getting searched, all, all the but here, equipment. But here's the there. painful reality, Jamal. We do have to worry about terrorism, but we have to worry about domestic terrorism now. So... I, that's why I keep coming back to this point. We draw a line politically from what happened with the invasions in Iraq and Afghanistan to where we are today. It's going to require a lot more uh, political and historical analysis. But we're more susceptible to terrorism now, domestic terrorism, than we've ever been. So I, I agree with you. On balance, it has been a catastrophic failure on, on most accounts. And lastly, the big thing is the goodwill of the American people. What? The way yeah, yeah. the way Americans are being viewed overseas yeah. because of these wars. That's that's the other thing. Our relationship with the rest of the war uh, of the world, and of course, we don't want to get into also what happened since Donald Trump uh, came into power and so forth. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to see all of our shows there, and we will talk to you next week. See you next week. Mm -hmm.